At Say Hi to the Future, we believe exploring, instilling, inspiring, and nurturing human ingenuity is a leadership imperative. It must be sought and can be honed in every leader. I'm your host, Saqib Vali, Explorer Say Hi to the Future, the fast-growing community highlighting the human side of ingenuity. Our guest today is Tim Roos, President and CEO of the Canadian Automobile Dealers Association. Tim is an international director with more than 29 years of progressive executive experience in sales, marketing, and retail in various countries, Germany, US, Mexico, Italy, and Canada. Tim has recognized expertise in strategy development, automotive, luxury consumer products, customer experience, and brand building. Tim also serves on the board of Call to Recycle as an independent director. Welcome, Tim, and thank you for taking time out from your highly driven schedule. Thanks for having me, Sukweep. Glad to be here. Tim, let's let our listeners hear in your voice how you would have wished to introduce yourself to them. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, so uh, Tim Royce, I've been in the automotive industry for over uh, 30 years, 33 years now. Um, it's always been my passion. And the reason it's been my passion, and it probably has to do with the demystifying you were talking about, is the automotive industry is actually probably one of the most innovative industries there is. It is constantly evolving, constantly changing, constantly improving itself. And so there's never a boring moment in the automotive industry. There's there's not a lot of industries that have been around for, what is it, almost 130 years or something now, and continue to, to reinvent, reinvigorate uh, themselves as an industry. You know, some companies faster than others, uh, some come in, some go out in the industry, but overall as an industry, um, and you are in the middle of people's lives uh, in the automotive industry because you know people need transportation, companies need transportation, goods need transportation, governments need uh, emergency services, um, and all of those things involve some sort of transportation vehicle or mode of transportation, um, and that is what for me has been so, so interesting in this industry. And I think might not necessarily be recognized by everybody from the outside, right? Um, is is how constantly innovating and changing the, the the industry is. When you just look at, you know, what what a car or a truck looked like uh, 40 years ago and what it is to, and where it is today, what types of technology it has in it, what type of safety standards it complies with, what type of emissions it generates, uh, all of those things. It's just tremendous to see, you know, that development. It's been an exciting journey to to be a part of that industry in one way, shape, or form over, you know, 30 some years now. There has been, there has been a lot of buzz around the automotive industry, especially in the last few years. Main shift being from ICE to EVs and autonomous vehicles. Right. Um, how the driver experience is and will transform, how the ownership experience in the future might also be very different, which would have further knock-on effects on dealerships and insurance and the grid, um, ride-hailing. The list goes on. So for someone that is in the thick of it all, help us distill the signal from the noise. On this one, I would probably start with, with a quote from, I think it was Steve Jobs that said, we we tend to overestimate short-term impact of things, right? And underestimate long-term impact of things. And I think that is sort of where we are right now. So a lot of the rhetoric is, is sometimes very loud, right? So if you were to read some, even of the automotive industry or economic press five or six years ago, you would have seen headlines that said, internal combustion engine is dead in five years, or a dealers will no longer be in business in four years. Th those types of, of sort of uh, statements looking at a sort of uh, extreme Jetsons era scenario of the automotive industry, right? Where nobody buys a car anymore. They're all electrified, autonomous, generic driving pods that you order up on your app, right? And they show up at your doorstep and you take it to go from A to B and nobody owns a car anymore. And then, you know, so sort of, you know, yeah, that scenario was theoretically possible. Uh, and who knows, it might still be in, you know, I don't know how many years, but then sort of reality starts setting in and uh, people's 
desires on how to live their lives, that that scenario probably doesn't necessarily take into consideration what people actually want to do and uh, how they want to get from A to B and their personal choices in their lives of what they want to do. In the transition, in those that the two that you mentioned on autonomous vehicles and, and electrification, the path is very different. The, the autonomous vehicles were the ones that, you know, already five years ago, everyone was saying, you know, the cars are going to be driving themselves. Well, where are they? They're nowhere near. And there's actually starting to be a retrenching of it, right? And actually not so much necessarily from a technology perspective, but from a societal acceptance of uh, uh, said autonomous vehicles. So if there is an accident, and there's a very famous case now happening in California where this has happened, where unfortunately uh, a person got, uh, I think, severely injured or even killed, not by the autonomous vehicle, but by another vehicle that, you know, hit a pedestrian and, you know, therefore put him into the path of an autonomous vehicle. But that has now retrenched that whole industry and is being analyzed for the first time from a societal, are we ready to accept that, that, that machines and, and the autonomous uh, autonomy and um, the algorithms in a car will be calculating who lives and who dies uh, to take those decisions. Are we comfortable with that as a society? So there's actually been a, a substantial retrenching of that and a slowdown of the path to autonomous, where now it's more along how can the technology of autonomy help you on longer trips, right, so that you're not as stressed can it help you and guide you in saying, hey, there's a there's a situation here you might not be aware of as you're driving, things of that nature, right? And on the electrical vehicle side, uh, the trend is 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 really starting to to pick up, but also there now reality starting to set in, right? Early adopters have, have have bought their vehicles, and now it's about how can you get the mass of the market into uh, zero emission vehicles. Um, or you know, electric vehicles and other solutions. Uh, and there, then reality starts setting in of rural and remote areas uh, where you know people need to drive long distances and need to have a fueling or recharging infrastructure that is dependable and works. And sort of all of a sudden, reality starts to set in there as well. But make no mistake about it, a long-term trend is definitely in the right direction, right? But as I yeah. said initially, we tend to overestimate what's going to happen in the short term uh, uh, or overestimate and underestimate the long-term impact. What would you say is the is the sustainability challenges? And I'm not talking about sustainability just in terms of green or, you know, climate change or whatever. I'm talking about sustainability from a business model standpoint. Mm. Um, you know, for example, are the challenges around attracting talent mm. to come into uh, working for dealers um, is the challenge around, uh, like we said, everyone's going to be buying a, a car on an app. So why do you need dealers? What are some of those sustainability challenges that you think about uh, along with your dealers? And how are you going about addressing some of those? Yeah, so the the on the sustainability side, you you hit the nail on the head on the on the staffing side uh, and and the personnel side. That is probably the biggest um, aspect that our members and any dealer is is worried about and is focusing so much energy on is attracting the right people and being able to retain the right people for a longer period of time, keeping them engaged in the industry. And there the 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 challenges are very, very different from, on the technician side, so uh, mechanics, and actually finding enough people willing to enter that industry, uh, very difficult in Canada, uh, and or the uh, bureaucratic hurdles you have to jump through to get somebody uh, from a third country to come into Canada uh, to take those jobs, because there are a lot of people that would like to take those jobs that are available in Canada to come in. Uh, but it it's then becomes a challenge to actually get it done from the just bureaucratic aspect, right? So having those people, so that's that's one aspect of it. But then also going forward, well, guess what? That mechanic that you're hiring today, his job's going to be very different in 10 years mm -hmm. as we progress towards electrification. Uh, he might no longer be doing that many uh, old changes, right? Uh, and things of that nature. So there's going to be a technology development. Uh, already today, somebody, a technician that you hire, that job profile is already very different than it was 10 years ago, right? 
Marina's technician today is working a lot with the computer. He plugs it into the car and tells him what's wrong. And he starts searching where, you know, if there's something wrong with the vehicle, how to get at it. So having that. Then the other aspect is just one that we're going through after the pandemic. Um, so we do have, unfortunately, a situation in, in automotive retail where there's a high rotation of individuals that uh, try it out as a as a career, sometimes see it doesn't work for them, um, or are then moving on to another dealership. Uh, there's a lot of poaching going on between uh, dealerships for personnel and things like that. So, so you have a fairly high rotation, especially, for example, on the sales floor. So if you go into a dealership today, chances are in most of them, you will find salespeople that have actually not ever sold a car in the sense of the last two years during the pandemic. They weren't really selling uh, because, you know, whatever was coming in, what little was coming in, they were distributing. So they were taking orders, if you will, from customers and being a logistics provider and an information provider to the consumer saying, you ordered your car. We told mm -hmm. you it was coming in six months. It's here. It's here. It's coming. That type of, of was the job profile the last two years. <clears throat> now we're starting to return to a normality where now supply is coming back and all of a sudden you might not have the right people on board anymore, right? Or they don't have the right skill set. So anyway, those are very down in the weeds sort of things of what's happening, but it's precisely to your point about sustainability. What keeps our members awake at night on the sustainability aspect is, is how can I find and keep the right people at the right time? How are you guys thinking about it? Mm -hmm. Like what are some of, the, some of the areas that your association or the dealers that, are, that you're working with how are they thinking about that? Right. So what we then try to 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 do to support our members on that is the longer term aspects is invest heavily time, energy and money in education. So, mm -hmm. for example, the Automotive Business School at Georgian College in, in, in Barry, the Canadian Dealer Academy and things of that nature to to also, uh, you know, the people that we have in the industry, make sure that their curriculums are up to date, that they get developed in their businesses uh, uh, appropriately. The other one is also uh, trying to make the automotive retail industry attractive for new entrants. So going to high schools, vocational schools, positioning, hey, uh, here's how much you can make actually in the retail uh, industry, automotive industry, which by the way, the salaries are, are very, very good, uh, not just competitive, but actually very, very good and, and higher than other industries in Canada that people might not know about. So how can so to try to make the the industry more attractive to young people, and then obviously as an association, our last piece is then also with the government on the lobbying side, trying to make the process for getting people into Canada that are willing to take those jobs uh, somewhat easier. So we have a, a lot of programs, uh, for example, from Quebec in uh, uh, northern French-speaking Africa, uh, for bringing people in, and now also in Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. Uh, with people from the Philippines coming in, right? Where, you know, our associations, the provincial associations, whose logos you see here in my background, uh, go actually to uh, the Philippines and uh, uh, and do the assessment of the people. Can they uh, really do what we think that they can do according to the assessments and everything else before bringing them to Canada? So we're trying to approach it from, from various uh, aspects to it, but it's it's a perennial issue for our industries, Sequeep. So uh, a few months ago, I, I did a sort of historic dig a little bit in our in our archives, and I found I found some old minutes from from uh, uh, 1953, uh, where our board uh, you know was discussing pretty much exactly the same topic. Right, so <laughs> it, it seems to be an evergreen topic in our industry. What's old is new again. Yes, <laughs> I can understand. It's heartening to know that um, an industry like the Canadian Automobile Dealers Association, that industry, there is a lot of innovation that's happening even at, at that level. So yes, there's innovation happening on the cars and the and the technology, and that's what's sexy and everyone latches onto it. But there is a lot of um, innovation that's happening around uh, this whole industry as well, which is which is fantastic. And so let me let me move to uh, an area which is close to our hearts, which is why we call it say hi to the future and high stands for human ingenuity, especially the human side of ingenuity, um, would love to get your take as the president and CEO of your organization. 
What is your leadership take on ingenuity, specifically the human side of ingenuity, uh, as you develop your leaders and speak to your people, et cetera? When has it worked well? When has it not? What have you learned um, in your in your absolutely impressive career? From my perspective, ingenuity and, and innovation rarely happen or rarely happens on its own uh, in a dark room. Um, it, it normally uh, starts happening when you have various individuals interacting with each other, exchanging experiences, talking about uh, problems or hurdles they might face, uh, talk about problems they're trying to solve for and get different perspectives. And in my experience, that is where innovation and ingenuity takes place um, and not you know, on your own somewhere in a, in a, in a dark chamber. So uh, for example, for, for our uh, uh, dealer members to, to your earlier point of, of how, you know, also dealer industry has innovated, what is now considered as part and parcel of, of selling a car is what we call F and I it's finance and insurance, right? So you're not only buying a car, you're buying financial and insurance products with that car, right? That will cover you in case you hit a pothole and you're, and your rim uh, 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 dense, or um, if you, uh, for some reason, are out of a job, and uh, you know your your credit is still covered for certain months of coverage, and things of that nature. Those were invented by car dealers, right? Um, in in their in their process of selling and, and servicing cars, um, and then uh, they get spread throughout industry by cooperating with each other and talking to each other. So one of the most interesting aspects that that I learned in this industry only very late in my career is how dealers actually actively exchange best practices, uh, even though they might be competitors, right? So you might have a, a dealer of brand A and brand B in the, in the same city, but they get together, you know, in what is called 20 groups, and they exchange performance data that sort of clearly shows how everybody's doing. And then say, well, hold on a second, you're doing a lot better in in selling whatever tire and rim insurance than I am. How are you doing that? And they start from there. And from those conversations, a lot of time, new ideas, new procedures come out, new processes come out, new product ideas, right? From that perspective, not you know physical product ideas, but mm -hmm. you know, things to sell or things to do come out. So uh, from my perspective, I think that's that's a that's an aspect that sometimes doesn't get enough sort of credit, if you will, right? You you sort of see the the person that might be identified with the idea and saying, oh, how ingenious is that person? Well, there was probably a process somewhere in an exchange with others that that triggered something in that person's mind that led them to think about this or implement this. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? I mean, and and uh, something that you pointed out, which we speak about quite a bit, but it's so heartening to see uh, or or hear from you is collaboration, right? And collaboration with a with an objective to solve a problem um, is where ingenuity takes place, uh, and that is that is such a such a cool way because our entire thought is around wicked problem solving um, and and how we think about that. Give me, give me, if you can, give me an example of a current problem that is being faced by all your different dealers and that you'd wish to collaborate on and, and see if you can come out with something. Is there, is there something that's top of mind for you? So let me give you an example from two years ago, because I think it encapsulates what we've just been talking about. So in the beginning of the pandemic here in Canada, right, uh, you know, governments were having to shut down economic activities, businesses were being shut down. And, you know, obviously our, our members were were worried about what's that going to mean for my business? Am I going to exist tomorrow? How do I go about it? And and there's no playbook, right? It wasn't like you could reach behind it in your cupboard and pull out the, okay, this is the pandemic handbook and let's see, okay, step one, two, three, it doesn't exist. So how do you go about it? And uh, until you know, we came to the point of saying, okay, maybe, you know, the pandemic hasn't started before, hadn't, uh, we don't have a pandemic playbook, but hold on a second, there's countries uh, in the world that have been dealing with this for now three or four weeks sort of ahead of us, right? Uh, they might be facing what we were facing, you know, they already did that a month ago. So how about we reach out and talk to them? 
So, you know, one of the first things that we did is reach out to our counterparts in, in China and in Italy, right? That were sort of in the beginning of the of the code, we're saying, okay, so how, what did you talk about with your dealers? What were their issues? How did you go about it and everything else? And, and from that clearly came a couple of important aspects out of those conversations saying, well, you know, the first thing you 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 need to you need to try to ensure is that that your dealers are classified as essential in the pandemic, right? Well, they are because you know without dealers to service a vehicle, you can't maintain, you know, uh, uh, the the ambulances, the fire trucks, um, you know, the police cars, uh, the doctors and nurses that were going to the hospitals can't get there if they can't get their service their vehicle serviced, or you know, their old one got crashed or something, they need a new one. So. You know, first thing you got to do is is that. So having that framing come from somewhere else helped us in devise a strategy here, right? And then say, okay, the other piece was, you know, conserve liquidity because you don't know what's going to happen. So from the financial crisis as well, those learnings incorporate those in your solutions, and then try to convey to the public as you then start, you know, trying to get back to normality that you're. You're taking, you know, uh, uh, your your protection protocols seriously on behalf of your consumers, but also on behalf of your personnel, like a guide of, you know, this is how to operate safely in a in a pandemic. So all of those thinkings came came uh, uh, to us from having those conversations and interactions. In this case, it wasn't, you know, just Canada; it was uh, globally with other jurisdictions that had then helped us, you know, implement things here that. You know, from the outside, if we were just here, you might say, oh, how ingenious of them. Well, not really. <laughs> you know, we just <laughs> we were just grabbing and taking from here and here and here and trying to piece it together from what we thought would be the right solution for here, for Canada. And and that's that's a great way for us to to think about our problems collectively, um, like like exactly how you yeah. mentioned. Um, you know what, Tim, we're going to move uh, a bit more from automotive and industry to uh, Tim Bruce, uh, mm -hmm. and and get to know, uh, and our listeners should get to know you a bit more. Um, so let me let me ask you this question. So take yourself back to the time when you were at Stanford, hmm. uh, just coming out, and knowing what you know today, oh. if you got the chance to retrace your steps, what would you have done differently? I, I would probably say take control sooner. Um, mm. I probably need to explain that a little bit. Yeah, I had, a, I had a very long and uh, uh, fulfilling career with one multinational company for for mm -hmm. you know 28 years in all those different countries you listed in the beginning, and it was it was very exciting and I loved every every moment of it and you know got to see the world and and have a great experience. But um, for too long in the beginning of my career, you know, I let the sort of the company guide me saying, oh, now you should do this. Now you should do that. Now you should go over here. And it was only till much later in, in life and in my career that I sort of said, hold on a second. You should have a little bit more control of this. Uh, and I started permitting myself to actually say no or say, I'd like this instead of this. Um, so if I were to go back and talk to myself that many, many years ago, coming out of the university, I would probably you know, tell myself, take control a little bit sooner in that in that career and and what would the and right now what is your motivation and guiding principle for the control that you've taken find what works for you um mm. in this case for me it 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 needs to i need to have fun with what i do uh obviously this industry is fun for me as you can see i'm you know i get emotional i get excited talking about this industry uh, so it has to make sense for for me as well um, that it's interesting, it's challenging, you know, where I can contribute, not just by doing, but also by thinking. You know, a purely administrative job is 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 probably not my bailiwick, right? I can I can do administration well, don't get me wrong, but I'd I'd much rather spend my time and my energy thinking about this is what's happening in the industry, this is what it needs, what it means for our members, this is what we can do to to help them, to serve them better. Uh, this is how we can advance things uh, in a more structured fashion, also from a strategy perspective. Uh, you know, that's how, how you and I met a uh, long time ago, um, you know, or along that. And and sort of, I, I always try to see that, you know, whatever it is I'm doing it sort of fits in with that. Very cool. How about uh, advice to other leaders? 
like what are what are some of uh, what are some of Tim Bruce's key insights uh, or or thoughts that you would like to share with other leaders who might be in similar situations or mm-hmm. coming up as leaders um, in your situation? Probably, the, 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 I would say two things. The first one is 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 remain connected, engaged, and curious. Um, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, you know, you even if you finally achieve a certain pinnacle in your career or in your job, you know, remain engaged, remain curious, remain connected, because you might see different things and it might make you, you know, better in your job and might give you a different perspective and a different angle on, on things. So, you know, remain also curious there to find out from, from other industries. And then the 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 second one would be more, it, I, too many times I've seen it where where people say or or see, well, I have this weakness that I have to get rid of, so I'm working very hard on eliminating that weakness. Um, personally, I think that's a huge mistake because if you eliminate your weakness, all you've done is not sucking. <laughs> so, uh, um, so I, I've always been more of the opinion: work on your strengths, work with your strengths, and and then find ways to compensate for your weaknesses or for your lack of interest in certain things. So, I mean, one example to give you, it's not because it's a weakness of mine, but, it, you know, I'm more interested in the sales and marketing and strategy side of things, right? I've never been so interested uh, on the financial side of things, right? I, don't get me wrong. I know how to read a balance sheet, uh, you know, and things of that nature, but it doesn't necessarily do it for me. So I've always made sure in my career that I have a very strong CFO at my side. Uh, you know, that's the way I, I look at it. I'd rather, you know, work on strengths than, than try to eliminate any weakness or, or lack of interest in, in certain areas. But, you know, don't be blindsided by it either, right? Very cool. Thanks a lot, Tim. This was a fantastic conversation. Um, our listeners would love to hear more from you. So we will tag you and, and Kata in our show notes. Um, but this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sikwe. Glad to be here. The Say Hi to the Future podcast series is produced by Sonia Romero, edited by Matt Miller, and special effects by Edward Vasquez. Please leave us your thoughts and let us know if there is a leader you want us to have a conversation with next.